Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello and welcome to the class on introduction to pathogenic bacteria and their laboratory diagnosis. I am Dr. Jyoti Nagmoti. We will begin with the lesson. Lesson objectives for today's class are that at the end of this lesson, the learner shall be able to learn about the bacteria, especially the pathogenic bacteria and approach to the laboratory diagnosis in general. To cover the objectives, as said, the contents are going to be discussed by just answering three questions in each segment. The first segment will answer the questions like what are pathogenic bacteria, why we need to study them and how do they cause infections. And in the second segment, we are going to approach the laboratory diagnosis of infectious diseases caused by bacteria. So, we will answer the questions like what is the principle of laboratory diagnosis? Why is it important to carry out the laboratory diagnosis in a prompt and a specific manner and how is it carried out? So, let us start answering the questions. The first one being what are bacteria? As we know that bacteria are the prokaryotic unicellular microorganisms like any other living beings, they utilize food to grow and to reproduce. Most of the bacteria are present around us rather we live amongst the bacteria, they live on our body and everywhere this concept is called as the ubiquitous nature of the bacteria. Although several millions of bacteria exist, but only few hundreds of them can cause the disease, this is rather a good news for us. Coming to the pathogenic bacteria, pathogenic bacteria are those which are capable of causing infection or disease in a susceptible host. The type of bacteria here, the pathogenic ones can be of two types, obligate pathogens which are even capable of causing the disease in a healthy person. For example, the mycobacterium tuberculosis and Yersinia pestis and the other group are called as the opportunistic pathogen wherein they cause the infection only in the immunocompromised host. The examples here being one of our own gut flora member that is the Ischgrisha coli and the atypical mycobacteria which can be present in the environment as well as as a commensal on the genital area could cause some infection if the host is compromised immunologically. So, these are the two different types of pathogens we can classify. Moving further bacterial morphology, learning the bacterial morphology is important, it has got several appendages like the capsule which may harbor the very important antigen, the cell wall is very important because it is going to help us differentiate between the gram positive and the gram negative ones. It also has the virulence factors like pili, the flagella which could also contain the antigen especially the flagellum and the pili helps in initiating the infection by helping the bacteria to adhere to our mucosal cell lining. Why we need to classify the bacteria? As I said, there are several millions of them exist, although many are not very important. Among the pathogenic ones even, categorization of those bacteria which are pathogenic is important because they will help us to identify them very quickly. We can classify them based on their morphology, metabolic characters, G plus C content that is the DNA and staining characters and the genetic characters. Let us consider how we classify them based on their morphology. Here we have important groups of bacteria. This particular structure is a spherical one called as a coccus bacillus, the rod shaped coccobacillus which falls in between these two and the comma shaped organisms vibrio, spirillum, the spiral organisms, spirochetes, the filamentous ones and the pleomorphic ones which do not have actual definite cell wall that is why they take different shapes and sizes. 
Well friends, I was telling you that the bacteria can be classified based on their morphology. Another way to classify them is based on a very simple and wonderful staining technique that is gram stain. The gram stain helps us to divide the bacteria into two major groups, the gram positive and the gram negative ones. Gram positive ones could be further divided based on their morphology as the gram positive cocci and the gram positive bacilli. On the other hand, gram negative cocci and gram negative bacilli. Gram positive bacilli can be further divided based on whether they possess spores or they do not. Let us consider some of the important pathogens in each of these categories. Day in and out we come across the gram positive cocci, they are the staphylococci and streptococci which you might have already heard about. The next group is the gram positive bacilli based on the spore forming nature. Next group is the gram positive bacilli, the ones which do not possess spore are listeria and corini bacteria and the ones which do have spores are the clostridia and bacillus. On the other hand here, the gram negative bacteria form the major group of bacteria which we come across in day to day practice. Examples of gram negative cocci are the Neisseria group of organisms and the examples of gram negative bacilli are Ischgrichia, Klebsiella, Proteus, Salmonella, Shigella and many others. Friends you must be wondering how do we remember this large group of organisms. I will help you to remember, I will give you a mnemonic to remember the group of gram positive bacteria which are not many, you can remember them by this mnemonic SSLC class boys. As I have marked here S for Staphylococcus, Streptococci, Listeria, Corinibacteria, Clostridia and the Bacillus. Hope this helps you. Continuing with the bacterial classification, the classification can be further based on their arrangement. If the bacteria are arranged in groups, grape like clusters they are called as staphylococci. If they are arranged in chains, streptococci, pneumococci are typical lanceolate shaped diplococci with a capsule around them. The enterococci which are typically described as having spectacle appearance. The arrangement of these cocci could be in group of fours or in eights if they are in group of fours called tetrads and sarcina if they are in eights. The classification could also be based on their oxygen requirement. We have the extreme type of environment which are the growth of aerobes and anaerobes especially the obligate anaerobes do not require any oxygen and in fact if they are subjected to oxygen they will be immediately killed. On the other hand we have aerobes which require the presence of oxygen for their growth and in between we have some micro aerophilic and the facultative anaerobes which can be okay with the presence of air. Friends what we are seeing here is the multiplication of bacteria. We can see how rapidly and how exponentially these bacteria are multiplying and they within a short time produce n number of bacteria themselves and the number may even go up to millions and billions. And day to day what we see on our petri dishes colonies are nothing but the growth of these bacteria which we can visualize once they grow in exponential numbers. Once we know the bacteria grow rapidly, of course they need staple diet for their survival. They need basically water, carbon dioxide, nitrogen source, inorganic salts and some of them are exacting in their growth requirements, they require some growth factors like vitamins. Other than that they also need oxygen as I said aerobes need oxygen, uh, some of them are capnophilic in the sense they require 10 percent carbon dioxide for their growth. They also need the optimum temperature, light, moisture, pH and atmospheric effect also have a great effect for their luxuriant growth. Bacteria possess some enzymes and these enzymes when detected on the bench top form the basis of our biochemical test what we do for identification of the bacteria. The bacteria can release some enzymes like catalase, coagulase, urease, oxidase, lipase and many others. 
Let us take for example here, if we start growing the bacteria in a medium which has the substrate for action of these enzymes, for example urease, we see the color change. The color change is nothing but the bacterial enzymic activity which has been explored in identifying the bacteria. Till now we have been learning about the bacterial classification, their morphology and the enzymic activity, growth requirement etc. Let us now look into what kind of infections they cause. As we know they can cause wide variety of infections, they are called as bacterial infectious diseases and some of them are shown here in this picture. They can cause infections in any part of the body, we name it there can be an infection caused by bacteria in any deepest part. When I said the deeper parts, mostly we think of anaerobic infections because the organisms do not exist on the aerated tissue in our body. For example, the anaerobic bacteria can cause the brain abscess, there can be nervous tissue infection, meningitis etc. Other than that, we see commonly upper and lower respiratory tract infections, we see many of gastrointestinal infections including food poisoning, the sexually transmitted diseases and genitourinary infections. Skin and soft tissue infections are also very commonly seen in our day to day practice. So, what we need to remember is the bacteria can be involved in any kind of infections, we have to take the clues and approach for their rapid diagnosis by knowing their structural and functional details. We have answered the first question till now that is what are bacteria, what are their characters. Let us answer the second question, why is it important to study the bacteria? Knowing the bacterial morphology is quite important because it helps us in rapid identification of the bacteria from the clinical samples we receive and also their colony morphology will help us in identification. It will also help us to predict what kind of immune response is going to be produced. Knowing the bacterial physiology or the functions of bacteria is rather crucial. It will help us to understand their pathogenesis which will help in prevention of the diseases. Understanding their antibiotic sensitivity pattern is possible, choosing the right culture media and the conditions we provide especially for aerobic and anaerobic organisms is important. Phenotyping, genotyping of the bacteria are possible that is why it is quite important to know the bacteria in detail so that we can hit the diagnosis and help the patient recover faster. Coming to the third question, how do they cause disease? They cause disease if they have virulence factors. So, what is the virulence of a bacterium? It is a degree of bacterial pathogenicity, it is based on the ability to adhere to the host cells and get away with the human immune attack and how they invade and how they produce toxin is nothing but the virulence of these bacteria. The more virulence factor a bacterium has, the more pathogenic it is going to be. The virulence factors can be present on their cell wall, as I said they could be present on the flagella, pili, capsule and outer membrane protein, they could either produce some toxins, the endotoxin and exotoxins. If the bacteria are going to release the toxin into the surrounding in the environment in the tissues, they are called as exotoxins. The endotoxins are the ones which will come out once the bacteria die. We know that bacteria have got virulence factors, however, first step in any infection when we discuss about the pathogenicity of a bacterium is how do they enter our body. They could be present inside our body or they could be coming from an external source. For example, if they are exogenous in nature, they could enter through any of the sites, here is the respiratory tract and they could get into the body or if they are endogenous infections, some of the bacteria are present inside us as the normal flora and they could enter into any other system through hematogenous, through lymphatic system etc. as we see here. The bacteria were already present in tuberculosis patient in a pot spine here and they have entered through the hematogenous route into the urinary tract and which could result into genitourinary tuberculosis. The mode of infection could be through inhalation, through droplets as we saw in the example and it could be through ingestion, 
textual contact and direct inoculation some of the pyoderma and soft tissue infection what we see could be as a result of the direct contact. Once they enter into the human tissue let us see how they cause infection. The exposure and adhesion are the first few steps once they are near the cells there are receptors the bacteria is going to be uh, received on the cell membrane as we are seeing there is a receptor here. However, even before that our human immune system is going to be trying to attack them and trying to conceal them to digest them. Let us see what happens further if the bacteria are stronger they have strong antigen on their cell surface and also some of them can release IgA proteases then the bacteria will come out of all this entrapment and they will succeed in entering the cell they will invade. Once they invade they start multiplying they become more in number and they start secreting some toxins it could be in the form of exotoxin or endotoxin. And ultimately the toxins as we see here are going to damage our tissues there can be necrosis and there can be initiation of inflammatory response tumor necrosis factor interleukins many of the inflammatory substances are released so that the bacteria succeed in establishing an infection in a tissue. This is how the pathogenesis of bacteria takes place. So till now we have answered first three questions related to the bacteria. The next thing what is important here is how do we hit the diagnosis of infectious diseases in the laboratory. So, we will start answering the next few questions. The laboratory diagnosis means whenever we come across a patient physician makes a clinical diagnosis based on the clinical signs and symptoms. However, only making a clinical diagnosis is not going to be sufficient because the etiology is not going to be established by then. Establishing the etiological diagnosis is possible by doing the laboratory diagnosis, growing the organisms in the laboratory, testing them against the antibiotic sensitivity forms the mainstay of patient specific treatment so that we will help the patient recover faster. What is laboratory diagnosis? Laboratory diagnosis is based on the principle that we need to establish the relationship between the bacterium and the disease. As we go with the Cox postulates there are 4 to 5 Cox postulates which we indirectly establish the relationship in the laboratory on the bench top we do some tests and we prove that this could be a pathogen which is responsible for the infection causing and also most important thing is testing them against the antibiotics. Let us answer the second question why do we have to go for laboratory diagnosis as I said that clinician will be able to make clinical diagnosis and he will be able to start only the empirical therapy. However, if we establish the etiological diagnosis it can be sometimes life saving because we would be able to suggest the specific antibiotic therapy against the disease. Especially this is true in case if the patient is suffering from severe infections bacteremia, endocarditis, meningitis, pneumonia etc. Carrying out the laboratory diagnosis is also going to reduce the morbidity, hospital stay and it will also reduce the chances of unwanted surgery and also it will help us to initiate preventive measures by designing some new vaccines, new prophylactic measures against bacteria as well as it will help us in carrying out the epidemiological surveys, the genotyping, phenotyping etc. will help us to have knowledge about what are the bacteria existing in a particular country or the area so that effective preventive measures can be initiated that is the importance of going for laboratory diagnosis. Now how do we go for lab diagnosis? We have plenty of methods for establishing relationship of bacteria with the disease they are called as direct and indirect methods in the direct method we either look for the evidence directly the presence of bacteria or their antigens in the tissues in the specimen what we re receive from the representative sites. The direct methods include microscopy, macroscopy that is the gross examination of the specimen, culture, growing them, identifying them and carrying out the antibiotic sensitivity. However, in this class we are just going to restrict our discussion to the macroscopy, microscopy, culture and the antibiotic sensitivity further tests will be covered in the next few classes. What are the steps involved in laboratory diagnosis? When we come across a patient 
selecting a proper clinical sample which represents the disease site is very important and sample will be collected appropriately. Then sample transport should be done promptly to the laboratory without any delay. Then in the laboratory we process the sample, we do microscopy, we grow them, we also test them against various antibiotics and we also identify them. Finally, we correlate the findings and we report bacterial culture as well as sensitivity to the treating physician. These are the general steps in the laboratory diagnosis. Let us take each step in detail as every step forms a very crucial part of laboratory diagnosis. Sample selection is very important as I said, the sample should be selected based on the signs and symptoms and the history given by the patient. Time of the symptoms appearing, all those are very important. The sample should represent the disease process, it should be directly coming from the disease site. And if we select a wrong sample, it could result in ambiguous results. This is very clear because we will not be able to hit the diagnosis, the disease process is elsewhere and if we collect a wrong sample, we will not be able to give the right diagnosis. It is very true that as we have a dictum with the computers, garbage in and out, it also holds good in the laboratory diagnosis. If they give us the right sample, we shall be able to help the physician treat the patient specifically. So, the sample selection was very, very important. Once we select the right sample, collecting it in a right way is also equally important. The quality of specimen is quite important. For example, if we are collecting sputum sample, it should be not saliva sample, it has to be actual sputum coming from deeper parts of the respiratory system. Another example is, if it is a urine sample, if the patient is not instructed properly to thoroughly cleanse the area, we could be mainly collecting the contaminants. Other than that, if the patient is not instructed to void the initial part of the urine and collect the midstream clean catch urine, then again the results of our culture are going to be a waste of our effort. They also have to be collected using aseptic techniques, avoid contamination. The quantity of urine or any other sample we collect is quite important, especially quantity matters when we are collecting the CSF sample. It should not be less than 2 ml. Timing of sample collection is very important. Samples have to be collected as soon as the patient comes even before giving the first shot of any antibiotic. Anaerobic sample collection is slightly different compared to the aerobic sample collection as we need to take care here that the sample should not be exposed to oxygen. In case they are exposed, then there is no point in processing them further as we would have already lost few of the important pathogens. The samples for anaerobic processing should be collected in the suitable containers like bio bags, PRAS media etc. However, the sample should not be coming from the superficial exudate or the pus would have been already exposed to air. We should go into the deeper parts of the wound and collect rather the tissue biopsy or the exudate which is oozing directly in the syringe or the airtight containers. Once the sample is collected, it has to be promptly transported. There are some transport media available, carry blares, thioglycolate etc. can be used including the Robertson cooked meat medium RCM can be used for transporting some of the anaerobic samples. In case we expect that there is going to be a slight delay before we send them to the lab, then some of the samples only can be refrigerated, but not all, especially the ones which are likely to contain the fastidious organisms like Streptococcus pneumoniae, Haemophilus influenzae, Corini bacteria, Neisseria, samples suspected to be having these organisms should be avoided from refrigeration. Now, once we receive the sample in the laboratory, we need to process it also very promptly. First step in the examination is the gross examination. We need to examine the specimen for the color, clarity, presence of any granules which suggest sometimes infections with actinomyces. There are presence of granules, there can be blood, zero sanguinous discharge especially present with streptococcal infection, it could be mucoid sample and if we think that the sample would contain the anaerobes, then there are peculiar signs that is putrid odor, presence of foreign body or presence of gas and lot of necrotic material plus the discolored 
sample. After that, we are going into the microscopic examination. In microscopic examination, we have two different steps. One, we can do it without subjecting the sample to any staining techniques, which include examination for motility that is a hanging drop preparation. This is important for examining the cholera stool samples with which we can hit the diagnosis within few minutes. The wet mount preparation which we do in case of urine, CSF and other uh, specimen. The dark ground microscopy and phase contrast microscopy could also come uh, in unstained preparation. This type of examination is quite easy, rapid and uh, it also gives us a lot of clue for laboratory diagnosis. Coming to the stained preparations, very important stains what we do day in and out in our laboratory are the Gram stain and the Zeal Nielsen stain. Gram stain is going to be discussed in the next few slides, even the Zeal Nielsen staining. The other staining are adopted when we suspect particular diseases, for example, Albert in case of diphtheria, Fontana staining if we are suspecting the spiroketal infections like syphilis, fluorescent stain can be done when we are examining the slide for the presence of acid fast organism. Well, friends, let us now consider some of the important stainings which are used day in and out in the microbiology laboratory. One of the simple and wonderful staining technique we have is the gram staining. The gram staining as I said helps us to differentiate the bacteria into two major categories as the gram positive and gram negative ones. You must be wondering how this differentiation takes place. Basically friends it takes place because of the differences in the cell wall and the cytoplasmic nature in the bacteria. Well when we make a smear from the sample we get subjected to primary stain then a mordant alcohol and the counter staining the differentiation between the bacteria occurs at this stage after decolorization and ultimately we are going to see the bacteria as the gram negative and the gram positive ones as you can appreciate. When we focus the slide under microscope, we can see the bacteria exhibited like this. In this picture, you can see the gram positive cocci and the gram negative bacilli. As I said, gram staining has lot of clinical applications and sometimes it can be a life saving staining technique. It not only helps us to identify the bacteria, it also helps us in their classification, it guides in therapy. As I said, it can be life saving in case of fatal infections like meningitis. Within 5 minutes, we can appreciate the organism, for example, Streptococcus pneumoniae. We can guide in the specific therapy. It also helps us to know whether the type of exudate is of chronic inflammatory type or the acute type. It also helps us to know the prognosis of any disease. Not only that, it helps us in the selection of culture media. Friends, now let us learn about another important differential staining technique that is Zeal Nielsen staining. The differentiation occurs here due to the presence of mycolic acid in the cell walls of certain bacteria like mycobacteria. The mycobacteria are known to be acid fast and they resist decolorization when decolorized with weak mineral acid in this technique. Ultimately, we are going to see that the bacteria appear reddish pink against the blue background and these are the pus cells you can differentiate. What is the application of this stain? This stain helps us to go for disease diagnosis especially in case of tuberculosis. It helps us in screening the disease, it helps in the prognosis of the disease and also it tells us about what is the type of cellular exudate. Another similar type of test is the fluorescent antibody test. Here it is especially suited for non-cultivable organisms and slowly growing organisms. What we do here is sample is mixed with specific antibody against the bacteria which we are suspecting to be present in the sample and mixed with the fluorescent. It is subjected to microscopy with under high intensity light. Here we see the apple green fluorescence. This is again less laborious. It is very specific because we are utilizing the antigen antibody reaction here. The bacterial culture is the next important step in the laboratory diagnosis. We have just subjected our specimen for gross examination, microscopy, stained and unstained preparation. Now is the bacterial culture. 
culture remains the gold standard for diagnosis though it is less sensitive but it is highly specific the growth time for most of the common bacteria within 24 to 48 hours this is a good news for anybody attempting bacterial cultures the sensitivity of solid media is quite less compared to liquid media it requires a solid media to show the colony if the sample contains any number of organisms between 100 to 1000 however if we are growing them in the liquid media as less as 10 bacilli per ml can give us the sensitivity for culture why we need to go for culture is because it helps us to go further and carry out the antibiotic sensitivity of the isolates it also helps us in typing the bacteria what we isolate before we start growing the bacteria we need to have some idea about what are the major group of media we can choose choosing the right culture medium is also important before we attempt any culture the culture media are basically classified as anaerobic and aerobic however there are other methods of classification as solid liquid synthetic semi synthetic etc anaerobic media are robertson cook meat media supplemented brucella blood agar KVLB, Canamycin, Vancomycin, Lake blood agar, etc. Aerobic, we have plenty of them. Nutrient agar, broth are the basic media which provide the staple diet for the bacteria to grow. There are some enriched media. Enriched media either contain blood, serum, egg, etc., which will help the fastidious bacteria to grow faster. The selective media. Selective media forms an important group because they suppress the other bacteria or the contaminants which are present in the sample they selectively allow the growth of pathogenic bacteria for example mekonkey agar is a selective agent for growing the enterobacteriaceae it will suppress the growth of other commensals present in the intestinal flora it will support the growth of pathogenic ones another selective medium which is commonly used is the lj medium lowenstein jensen medium used for growing the bacteria from tuberculosis cases mycobacterium tuberculosis again sample might contain some throat commensals oral organisms which will be all suppressed when we try to grow the mycobacteria in the lowenstein jensen medium once we inoculate the plate we incubate them on the day one we are doing all the inoculations after we carry out the microscopy gross examination once we inoculate we incubate them for 18 to 24 hours the colonies will be produced this is how we see the growth on the culture media some of the bacteria can be producing hemolysis on the blood agar some of them may produce dark colored colonies on potassium telluride the blood agar may also show different type of non hemolytic type of colonies so there are n number of colonies what we can have produced from every single bacteria this is the growth on the lj medium so next thing is now we are going to examine them in detail the colony characters their color size shape structure everything is going to matter for their identification an expert microbiologist shall be able to just look at the plate and say oh i could be dealing with this particular organism so we can become so proficient once we start examining these colonies in detail we will take hand lens for examining the details of the surface margin their size shape etc they can be of various types as shown here some of them produce the pigment till now we have grown them we have identified their colony characters but still we would like to confirm are we dealing with the same organism what we had seen on the previous day microscopy pick up the colony and again we can subject it for gram staining once we do the gram staining we will be sure that we are continuing with the same bacterium or the pathogen here for example if a gram stain of a colony we are dealing with shows the gram positive cocci then we can think of one of these major group of pathogens in the gram stain as i had discussed with this slide earlier we might be dealing with the staphylococci because the cocci which are arranged in bunch in this slide we can go ahead with a further test to confirm staphylococci here for example if you are dealing with the gram positive cocci we also have certain other supporting uh, evidences from the their culture we can also go for catalase if it is a beta hemolytic one to differentiate whether it is staphylococcus streptococci then we can go for coagulase and uh, some other test as mentioned here and also we carry on uh, different biochemical reactions 
if for example, we have come across with a gram negative bacilli by gram staining, then there are different tests which we could subject them for. We have grown them on the McConkie's agar, the gram stain has helped us to choose the medium as well. McConkie agar can show us the lactose fermenting, non lactose fermenting colonies. Based on them, we can also choose various other biochemical tests to further categorize them and finally, identify them. Triple sugar ion agar and some of the other battery of tests, indole, methyl red, vox prosker, citrate, they are all in group called as the imvic tests, which will help us differentiate between the gram negative bacteria. Ultimately, it is like a permutation combination. We have the results of all the cultural characteristics, microscopy, the biochemical results, we, we match them with the known test results and then we finally, identify them. For example, here is a test reaction given by Ischgrisia coli. Imvic reactions of E. coli are shown. This is how we identify the bacteria to their final species level. But what is most important uh, yet to be done in the lab diagnosis is the antibiotic sensitivity test. This is essential especially when we are dealing with the resistant bacteria, especially when we are dealing with the methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus to test it against various antibiotics, especially against cefoxetin and oxacillin to know whether it is MRSA or not. Some other bacteria are also resistance is on the high rise nowadays is Enterococcus faecalis, Enterobacter faecium. These both have to be tested against vancomycin, mycobacteria to be tested against different drugs because they are also now becoming multi drug resistant. However, the antibiotic sensitivity is not indicated if we have grown some commensals, if we have uh, grown some organisms like the group A streptococci and the bacteria which have come from our own skin, the epidermidis, unless it is indicated and clinically correlated. The methods which are available for antibiotic sensitivity are the diffusion method and the dilution method. The diffusion method is Kirby Ball disk diffusion method wherein we have the grown the bacteria in a lawn culture and applied the discs containing antibiotics here and after overnight's incubation, we see that some of the bacteria fail to grow around some of the antibiotics producing zone of clearance. The zone is measured and interpreted as per CLSI guidelines to know whether it is sensitive, resistant or intermediate against the drugs with which we are testing. This is how the zone is measured and interpreted as per CLSI guidelines. Another method we have for antibiotic sensitivity testing is a more sensitive method that is minimum inhibitory concentration MIC values. MIC values of a bacterium against different drugs can be tested. Here is a tube dilution and we see that this is a cutoff. The drugs are diluted and the bacteria are inoculated. This is the cutoff wherein the bacteria are not able to grow at this particular concentration and MIC values are interpreted looking at the table and it is given as the MIC value of that bacterium against a particular drug. MIC value is important sometime in treating critical infections wherein we can adjust the dose and we can help the patient recover. In this diffusion method, it will give the absolute values that whether it is sensitive or resistant whereas here the MIC we will be able to control the dose. We have some rapid and point of care tests also for rapid detection of bacteria rather than going for culture which will minimum take 24 to 48 hours for identification. The rapid methods include blood culture system, Bactec, etc. And we can also identify the bacteria grown in the culture by identification systems like Vitec and uh, all the others. Advantage of these method is that there is a rapid turnaround time and the identification is based on inbuilt database which will help us even identify the rare pathogens which will be quite cumbersome to do on the bench top. Finally, we have grown the bacteria, we have tested them against various antibiotics. Now, we need to give the report to the treating physician. Before we do that, it is important for us to 
look at our isolate, try to correlate with the disease signs and symptoms and the condition of the patient. All these three points need to be correlated and a sensible report has to be given immediately. Sometimes the antibiotic would have been started empirically which might not be working with in a particular patient. Then our antibiotic results will be helping the physician to treat the patient with the specific antibiotics. With this we have answered questions related to the bacteria and we have understood the general steps and how do we go about laboratory approach for infectious diseases in this class. Finally, my take home message is that understanding classification, structural, functional and virulence properties of bacteria really help us the laboratory diagnosis. Ultimately, when we make a prompt laboratory diagnosis, it will help us in better patient care. Thank you.